On September 11, 2001, the people of Canada came to our aid, managing an unprecedented crisis in the skies. They also took care of tens of thousands of displaced passengers who arrived at their doorstep on short notice. This is the story of one small town that didn't get the attention it deserved in the chaotic aftermath of 9-11 in so many ways. It symbolizes the grace and the unselfish spirit of this very generous nation. September 11th, 2009. This is a scene that has played out in communities for eight years since the terrorist attacks of 2001. But what makes this ceremony different is where it's taking place. This is the Appleton Peace Park near the town of Gander in Newfoundland, Canada, where during the tragedy of 9-11, there was a bright light on the better part of our humanity. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that has happened here. And we know that no matter what happens in the world, there are still good people. If this place can be somehow shared with the world, the world would be a much better place. Here in Gander, amid the heartache, an autumn romance blossomed. Here, Parents were constantly consoled as they faced wrenching pain. Here, thousands of stranded Americans would form a lasting bond with everyday Canadians who acted with admirable, unwavering kindness. We can never again look at the New York skyline without remembering that day, September 11th, when terrorists hijacked airliners loaded with passengers and jet fuel, flew them into the World Trade Center and killed 3,000 people, altering the lives of an untold number of others. Most of our attention that day, of course, was focused here in New York, but it was a story that reverberated around the world, and it had a special impact on a small Canadian town a thousand miles north of here, a town that became a safe port in a storm of fear, terrorism, and uncertainty. The province of Newfoundland and Labrador, a former British colony that did not join Canada until 1949, has long been considered Canada's poorest it is largely populated by descendants of Scots and Irish, living simply in often harsh conditions. Here, neighbors relying on neighbors is a necessity of everyday life. Gander, population 10,000, is a small two stoplight town in the northeast corner of the island of Newfoundland. Claude Elliott has been mayor of Gander since 1996. We only have a half a million people on a massive island. We've come through some difficult times, and most Newfoundlanders survive with uh, hard work, uh, helping each other, and that's been passed on from generation to generation. The cold season can come quickly and severely in Newfoundland, but September 11th, 2001 dawns warm and sunny, a typically bucolic day that will be anything but typical as Gander is about to be thrust into the catastrophic events unfolding a thousand miles to the southwest, its citizens to be challenged as never before. September 11, 2001 uh, started as a normal day in Gander. While we were having coffee, someone said there was a plane that crashed in New York in one of the Twin Towers. We had complaints of speeding on Airport Boulevard. It's the only four-lane road that we have, and I was parked in front of the curling club. I had my car radio, and I heard what was going on. And like a lot of people, I couldn't believe that this was happening. And I said, that can't be true. It just can't be. It is such a pretty morning, isn't it? Perfect fall morning. 
On that September morning, air traffic control veteran Ben Sliney is on his first day in his new position as FAA National Operations Manager. Barely an hour into the workday, there is an ominous development. We were trying to locate American 11. It had shut off its transponder and dropped below radar coverage. Thank you very much. We appreciate the book is called Hughes. We want to go live right now and show you a picture of the World Trade Center. A plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. We saw what appeared to be a fireball at the top of the World Trade Center. We had reports of another aircraft that had deviated from its course. Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. U.S. officials say it appears it was a third plane that hit the Pentagon. I ordered a national ground stop, meaning that no other aircraft could take off. And whatever's necessary, get, just get them stopped now. I don't want any more Fre planes on their frequency taking off. 56 minutes after the North Tower is struck, an unprecedented decision has been made. Every non-military plane must land immediately. For the first time ever, American airspace is closed. This is war. This is a declaration and an execution of an attack on the United States. The only way to really sort the situation out was to uh, land everyone in our airspace. The FAA now says that all international flights headed for the United States are being diverted to Canada. Every day, as transatlantic flights enter and leave North American airspace, they are managed here the Area Control Center in Gander, Newfoundland. Canon 1174 Center, good day. Clear to send to maintain 6,000 feet. On September 11th, when U.S. airspace is shut down, there are almost 400 planes carrying tens of thousands of passengers westbound over the Atlantic. Around 200 are close enough to return to Europe. 167 more are too far across the ocean to turn back. When did you begin to be aware of what was about to happen in Gander? The flights that had been crossing the Atlantic more than halfway, many of them were going to be headed for Gander and St. John's and Halifax, but Gander would be the big magnet. I knew that uh, the Canadians were going to get an onslaught of traffic, and uh, I, 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 I suppose I hoped that they'd be able to handle that traffic. 60 north, 20 west. The responsibility of handling the traffic falls to a small team led by Don O'Brien, the supervisor on duty at the control center for NAV Canada, the Canadian version of the FAA. The arrival sector, we normally would have three controllers seated. We quickly went to 14. We train for emergencies, we train for bomb threats, but usually it's a single airplane or maybe a second one maybe, but not to this level, the activity was going on here. Was another part of your mind thinking about what had happened in New York and the possibility that there were more terrorists out there? I'm sure it went through the controller's heads, it went through my head, but sure, some of those airplanes could have been missiles. We didn't know how extensive this was, but that wasn't our call, really. We just had to get those airplanes on the ground safely. One of the pilots approaching Newfoundland is Beverly Bass, the first female captain at a major airline. She's flying American Flight 49 from Paris to Dallas with 170 people on board. From the controller's standpoint, they feared that another airplane was going to be taken down. Some of the airplanes were given directions to turn around and go back to their departure city. So we're sitting there cruising westbound and looking out the window, and you can actually see them turn and make 180s and head back to Europe. Newfoundland is an island located off the eastern edge of North America. The 167 planes approaching Canada all must land immediately. The vast majority at small airports around the island and in the nearby maritime provinces, all controlled in Gander. Over the next seven hours, Gander Control and the surrounding airports will handle unprecedented traffic under extreme emergency conditions. Get our Air India 113, here we go to Toronto. The Air India 113 Center, uh, negative. We must now land at Gander. Uh, turn right, heading 320. After uh, turning right, heading 320. Flight paths must be recalculated in three dimensions, accounting for speed, direction, altitude. Some planes are too heavy to land and must jettison fuel. 
The risk of collision is ever present. This is an actual radar tape from that morning. Now you're starting to turn them toward Dander. Yes, we got the word, of course, and, and we had to heel them all northward into Gander, St. John's, and Stephenville. Some of them knew there was activity going on in, in, in Kennedy and there was a crisis in American airspace. Some of them didn't. We were telling them, look, you got to land. And they're saying, no, we're going on to Kennedy or Dallas or wherever. And they said, no, you're not. In the air, as they learn the shocking details, captains worry their own planes could be carrying hijackers, forcing many to hide the truth from their passengers. Our captain came on the PA system and announced that um, we had a slight mechanical problem, something to do with an indicator signal or something like that. Um, we were going to have to put down in Gander to have it repaired. Shirley Brooks Jones is a retired fundraising administrator for Ohio State, returning home from Frankfurt, Germany, on board Delta Flight 15. Once we got parked, the captain came back on the intercom, apologized to us for the ruse, and said actually the equipment was fine, but there was a national emergency in the United States. Three aircraft that we know of were commandeered. One was crashed into each of the World Trade Center towers in New York City, and another was crashed into the Pentagon outside Washington, D.C. Uh, apparently some type of uh, what would appear to be a, maybe a terrorist activity or hijacking has occurred um, with airplanes which apparently have impacted the World Trade Center in New York City. On September 11th, eight domestic flights are scheduled to land in Gander. Instead, 38 planes carrying almost 7,000 people are beginning to fill the tarmac. The spectacle has drawn a crowd from among the town's 10,000 citizens. Oz Fudge is one of just two officers on the local police force. I watched the plane come in, then I seen a jumbo come in, and then I seen another one coming in. I'm looking at this and I'm saying, holy God, there's, if, if, there's, if there's 200 people on each one of these planes and we're gonna get 40 or 50 planes, that's an awful lot of people. Less than two hours after American Flight 11 strikes the North Tower of the World Trade Center, the skies over the United States are empty. For the first time, American aerospace is completely closed. In Canada, the Gander Area Control Center somehow lands all 167 planes without incidents. It was a sigh of relief. You wipe your brow, and you thank God they all got in safely. And it was unbelievable to go from this horrific activity, and then the airspace is completely sterilized. Nobody there, Nobody, no targets on the radar screen. Here in New York, the sad task of the search for the survivors and the victims goes on and on. In New York, citizen volunteers are flooding toward ground zero as emergency workers search for survivors. A thousand miles from the destruction, the 10,000 residents of the peaceful Canadian town of Gander, with virtually no time to prepare, must also respond with countless acts of generosity, providing food and shelter for thousands of frightened passengers, strangers who have suddenly arrived at their door. Among the stranded, far from home, are the parents of a New York City fireman. Not knowing if their son is at ground zero, Hannah and Dennis O'Rourke fear they may never see him again. Transatlantic flights underline the strategic importance of Newfoundland's airports. Gander was an airport before it was a town. In the late 1930s, British and American military officials chose this site on the eastern edge of the continent to build the largest airport in the world. During World War II, this was a takeoff place for American military aircraft headed for the European theater. After the war, Gander continued to play a vital role as a refueling stop for transatlantic commercial airliners. But then the jumbo jets came along. They could cross the Atlantic nonstop. 
and Gander's role in aviation was greatly reduced until September 11th, when Gander came alive again, a safe harbor for the jumbo jets that had almost put it out of business. And within a matter of hours, this vast tarmac was filled with planes from around the world, parked wingtip to wingtip. Canada is basically becoming a gigantic runway for every plane and aircraft that was destined for the United States today. In Gander, no one is allowed off the planes until customs and security are in place. Run by airport officials and officers from the regional headquarters of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Mounties. They must process each passenger, plane by plane, until authorities are certain there are no terrorists on board. Among the trapped passengers is New York State Police Officer George Vitale, who is returning from Ireland where he was doing advanced security for New York Governor George Pataki. We were on this plane for 19 hours, sat in the tarmac, not really knowing what was going on outside, but knowing that it was pretty horrific. The number of casualties will be more than any of us can bear, ultimately. And I don't think we want to speculate on the number of casualties. The effort now has to be to save as many people as possible. There is another New York couple on the Gander tarmac whose connection to the events back home couldn't be more personal. I just wanted to get off the plane and see what was happening, because I was hoping my son wasn't working that day. Dennis and Hannah O'Rourke have been visiting relatives in Ireland. When they learn what has happened, they fear for their 44-year-old son, Kevin O'Rourke, a firefighter from Rescue 2 in Brooklyn. I guess it goes back many years to when I was a kid. The apartment building I lived in, over the years I was there, it ended up having three different fires, so I was carried out as a child uh, by, uh, by a firefighter. Um, so I have fond memories, you know, I have memories to go back to, you know, all of a sudden, you know, in the smoke, this big guy comes up, grabs me, and carries me down the stairs. When he was going for his fire test, and he said, Mom, you pray for me. Uh, and I said, yeah, Kevin, yeah. He said, pray for me to pass. I said, yeah, Kevin. So he missed it by, what, one or two points? And he came home that night, and he looked at me. He says, you didn't pray for me. I didn't pass. I says, no, Kevin, I prayed for you, you did. So he says, Mom, that's all I want. That's my calling, is to be a fireman. While the desperate rescue operation continues in New York, Gander begins the process of absorbing all those passengers, so many that in a matter of hours, they will nearly double the local population. Now, Gander is a town of barely 10,000 people. There was over 6,000 of us. Now, if you extrapolate the numbers, New York City's 8 million people, so what's that? 6 mil million people showing up on your door saying, okay, we're here, do something. The painstaking process of registering and removing each passenger continues through the night. Finally, we're free, we're free. We're on the ground after more than 24 hours. We have no idea where we're going, but we're going. It is not until noon on Wednesday, September 12th, when the last passengers are finally allowed into the Gander Terminal. They are exhausted and confused, most not knowing where in the world they have landed. We're going to bus you into Gander, which is just a few minutes away. We're not sure when the FAA is going to open up the United States to travel again. Uh, the Department of Transportation in Canada has all air traffic in Canada shut down right now. Uh, when you see the footage of what has happened, you'll appreciate why things have been done the way they are. The only vehicles available to transport the great volume of passengers from the airport are school buses, and the local bus drivers happen to be on strike. We were told at the time, we got a crisis on our hands, and the strike never came into effect whatsoever. All the bus drivers came back, every one. And we all came back, and we did our job. They laid down their picket signs, they went and took their buses, and they drove it. And for the next four or five days, just helped out wherever they could. And that's what we're made of. That's the type of people we are. Even though those bus drivers had a dispute with their employer, they had no dispute with the people that landed here. 
We'll do the best we can to look after this. If there's anything you need, anything at all, I mean anything, just ask, and you will be taken care of, bottom line, okay? We'll make as comfortable as possible. As passengers arrive in town, the locals rush to meet them with home-cooked meals. Among them is lifelong Gander resident Beulah Cooper, an organizer at the Canadian Legion Hall. Seven o'clock that night, I got a phone call from the Legion and asked me to do a tray of sandwiches. They have them down there by eight o'clock. I didn't know what was going on. I brought down a tray of sandwiches and I found out about the planes. Your heart went out to each and every one of them because the first thing you do is put yourself in their shoes and know how you would feel. Currently, there are thousands of people in Gander and surrounding area that need your help. Please come to their assistance, lend a hand, lend a meal, offer your services wherever possible. Passengers are not allowed to remove their check bags from the planes, so the clothes on their backs and in their carry-ons may be all they'll have for days. Ganderites respond, donating clothing and opening their shops free of charge. Show your boxes to the camera. <laughs> Hundreds of passengers are also without their prescriptions until owners of the two local pharmacies working day and night and across language barriers can fill them all again at no cost. They were able to go into the stores and just take items off the shelves. I'm not even sure they had to pay for them. They, the people were so accommodating in Gander. This is our coach. <laughs> our chef. This is our chef. Oh, yeah, chef. Even with all the kitchens firing around town, the local citizens cannot possibly feed 7,000 people. The Red Cross and Salvation Army send additional food and supplies fueled by donations from throughout Newfoundland. We can't thank everybody enough. It's been brilliant. Everyone seems to have pulled together, you know. Uh, it's amazing where all the, the, the stuff has come from. The community center is also acts as a ice rink, and we stored all the food on the ice surface, and we became known as the largest walk-in refrigerator in the country. Another problem. Gander has only 500 hotel beds for almost 7,000 unexpected guests. Local schools, churches, and legion halls must be converted into makeshift dormitories filled with sleeping bags, blankets, and cots. It is only as the passengers are settled around Gander that they see for the first time images of the devastation back home. There's the plane, you can't miss that. Some 30 hours after all of this had happened, we finally saw the pictures on television and we just stood there you know, not saying a word and just watching those pictures over and over and over. I think a lot were in shock. You could see that look in their faces of total lost. We don't know what's happening. They're in a place called Gander. Uh, their country has been attacked. They're talking thousands of people that may have perished. What's happening? What is happening here? I apologize to the families of um, people that are lost right now. Uh, we have lots of families seeking information about who was in the World Trade Center. Did they get out? Didn't they get out? Are we able to recover them? Aren't we able to recover them? And uh, we don't know the answers to all of those questions yet. Hannah and Dennis O'Rourke are staying at the Canadian Legion Hall in Gander. By now, They've learned that their son, Kevin, had been one of the early responders at the World Trade Center and that he is among the missing. Now, I've seen on the TV what happened to the Twin Towers. And uh, I didn't want to alarm her, but I knew that when they collapsed, I, I figured nobody would get out of that thing. But we prayed. I came here and prayed, hoping he would survive. reality, you know, as far as in the city of New York, that you are going to uh, lose, you know, lose some of your fellow brothers, you know, battling uh, the Red Devil. Just uh, luck of the draw, I guess. He says, some are called for nurses, doctors, priests. My calling is to help people. And that's my calling to be a fireman, helping other people. 
and saving people's lives. This is an effort involving people that came in on half a day's notice. Some very anxious people, some very worried people, but yet some very thankful people for the hospitality that only the people of Gander and surrounding area can show. These strangers are just taking us into their home. And it was not just taking us into their home. It was, here's the bathroom, here's fresh towels, here's the refrigerators, plenty of food. And then what they said is, now you know where the house is. The door is open. I got to tell you, this experience with your town has just been beyond belief. We were uh, buying some, some uh, clothes earlier for the extra day stay, and the uh, shopping clerk actually invited us to her house to take a shower. So it's been, uh, it's been like that ever since we've been here. And the people are real nice, you know. I can't believe it, you know. Everybody put their arms around you, you know, and it's always food coming in all the time. There's not one person that we have come across who hasn't offered to help us in some way. It's overwhelming. They didn't think of themselves at all at any time. And they'd be in that kitchen and working all day and work the night. It didn't, it didn't phase them, so they were there for you. Other than her daily walk to church, Hannah O'Rourke refuses to leave the Legion Hall. Beulah Cooper, the Legion Hall organizer, can't help but notice her pain. My son is a fireman, but I know this is not New York. And your heart really went out to them. And I tried to get them to come up here and stay, but they wouldn't leave the Legion because they were afraid they'd miss a phone call. She was fantastic to us, and so was everybody else, but Beulah was special. She was like a mother. That motherly love, she'd hold you, you know, and she was great. I talked to her, tried to take her mind off things, and, but I know I didn't do that because you can't take a mother's mind off her child. Beulah Cooper tends to the Aurochs day and night. She walks Hannah to church to pray for Kevin and for his fellow firefighters. The community, the love that they have, you could feel it every place around, you know. And they keep yeah, telling you, keep uh, faith, he'll be fine. He, you'll find him. He'll, he'll find his way out. I says, if anybody can, Kevin will, you know. So, it was in God's hands. The quiet peace around Gander was shattered on September 11th when almost 7,000 airline passengers were forced to land here. They came to be known as the Plain People, and they almost doubled the local population. Many of them didn't know the fate of their loved ones. They were confused and anxious. But that anxiety was quickly replaced by gratitude. Gratitude for the exceptional acts of kindness and comfort offered by ordinary people. When we were stranded here, we were very vulnerable, but everyone made us feel so loved and at home and comforted. Everybody just put everything on hold to take care of us. Diane Kirschke of Houston is traveling home alone after visiting her son's family in Huntington, England. In Gander, she has met another passenger from Continental Flight 5. His name is Nick Morrison a button-up oil industry engineer from Worcester, England, on his way to Texas for business. Originally scheduled to fly on September 10th, his company had postponed his trip by one fateful day at the last minute. That's where I first saw Diane, which was over here. She was sat on an army cart all on her own. There were a bunch of other women over there. There was something in the order of 90 people here. Life, you're on a treadmill, and you get up, you go to work, you come home, you get up, you go to work, you come home. And you, you perhaps don't have time to stop and examine where you are. And all of a sudden, you're plucked out of this everyday life for four days. And yes, you do get a chance to examine reflect. where you are and where you want to go. U.S. airspace reopens on Thursday, September 13th. Over the next three days, the Gander Airport once again becomes a swarm of activity. Around town, the schools and legion halls begin to empty. 
our community at a sense of sadness because they didn't know if they were ever going to see and probably never will see a lot of those people again. But there was also a lot of friendships developed from it. So there was a sense of sadness, but a sense of relief uh, that Hi did something good to help those people. We rode on a school bus to go back to the airport to leave. And of course, I had already been crying because we were leaving the people that we'd met here. And Nick was trying to comfort me, and he was going to kiss me on the forehead. And well, I didn't think about him being a gentleman and kissing me on the forehead. I thought he just missed my lips. So I just grabbed him and kissed him on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley Brooks Jones, the retired Ohio State Fundraising Administrator, boards Delta Flight 15 to begin her journey home. She's constantly thinking about the generosity of the people in the Gander area, wondering what she could ever do to pay them back. And then going home, an inspiration. All of us, as we were leaving, tried to leave some money with the people and they wouldn't take it. They'd just look at us and they'd say, no, you do the same for us. Once the flight is airborne, Brooks Jones asks the pilot if she can make an announcement, a request really for passengers to donate money toward a scholarship fund for graduates of Lewisport Collegiate School, where so many have spent their days in Newfoundland. Several of the men went around, picked up the pledge sheets, counted up how much the people from, from all over the world had, had uh, pledged, and they had pledged something over $15,000 US. When Delta 15 touches down in Atlanta, the passengers and crew who for days were left wondering if anyone remembered them are surprised by the warm, enthusiastic welcome they received. After four stressful days spent tending to her passengers, and with the thought of two hijacked American Airlines flights still fresh in her mind, Captain Beverly Bass recalls the moment she arrived home in Dallas. So we're rolling down the runway. I'm looking straight ahead, and I put the airplane into reverse, and it's the first chance I've had to look to the right, and that's when I saw the American flag. That was it. That was the first time that my emotions came into play. George Vitale returns home to a New York deeply wounded by 9-11. His every day, a reminder of what was lost. I come out my house and now I'm looking at that Manhattan skyline in front of me and there's this gaping hole. And I remember becoming so overwhelmed uh, emotionally that I just uh, broke out in tears. I lost a lot of people that I knew, co-workers that never came home. I have sometimes uh, guilt because my experience was so warm. I've made lifelong friends. It's kind of like if this evil attack by evil people never happened, I would have never met on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, the most wonderful people on earth. The O'Rourke's finally arrive home on Saturday afternoon, four days after they were diverted to Gander. It will be nine more days before they finally get the call they had been dreading. Kevin's body has been recovered in the rubble of the North Tower. I know Kevin so well. He'd be the last man out if it was his way. He'd get everybody out before himself, no matter be it. That's the type he was. He was only 44 years old. Parents aren't supposed to bury their children. Children are supposed to bury their parents. The way he died, it was hard. It was hard. I tell you, each year it gets easier. It don't. It gets harder. regular rhythm of everyday life in Gander returns quickly following that extraordinary week in September. 
Schools are schools again. Churches fill on Sundays. Therefore, we proclaim. Legion halls open their doors. But the bonds forged in that short time endure to this day. Shirley Brooks Jones has returned 17 times to give back to the people who were so generous to her. How big is that scholarship fund now? The scholarship fund is approaching uh, with insurance uh, and cash around $900,000. Wow. And um, 111 young people of the Lewisport area have been helped by that scholarship. Last spring, Stacy Hoff is one of 12 Lewisport seniors awarded a Delta 15 scholarship. And it comes to no surprise, I'm sure, that the graduate of the year for 2009 is Stacy Hoff. She is now a freshman at Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland. I was proud. I was proud not only to receive the scholarship, I was proud of my community for what they have done. No. Well, the folks around here changed your life, but you changed their life as well. Yes, we've become very, very close. They're my second family, really. <laughs> The Gander experience also forms a new family. After their impulsive goodbye kiss, Nick Marson and Diane Kursky, living in Ocean Apart, continue to phone and write each other. He visits her in October 2001 and again in December, and ultimately arranges to be transferred to the Houston office. On September 7, 2002, they are married, and for their honeymoon, they return to Gambo the village near Gander where they met. The community welcomes them back with a song written just for them. So when you said to your friends in England, I was stranded in Gander, but I met this lady from Texas. <laughs> they say, Nick, what's going on with you here? One of my friends said to me, has she got that um, uh, Texas twang? <laughs> and I said, yes, and you still love her. <laughs> <laughs> For the O'Rourke's, memories of 9-11 remain deeply painful. But the lasting gratitude they feel for a kind stranger who became a dear friend during their darkest hours brings them back to Gander for the first time, eight years after they have buried their son. I don't believe it. it made you feel right at home, like you were friends forever. And you don't forget that. In your case, you had great loss. But great gain because of all these friends that you made here. Oh, I made great friends. They'll be your like, friends forever. Forever, forever. Can never thank them enough. Uh, it is unbelievable what these people have done. The love that's here. Everything, you know, it's just unbelievable. What we keep encountering time after time is an enormous contrast between the darkness of the events in the United States and the goodness that was going on here. So in many ways, Gander played a critical role, not just in getting people through that time, but as an example of what humanity can be when it's at its best. Well, I think it was, there was a, a, a lady, she was 80 years of age, and when she was leaving, I think she summed it all up. She said, when I heard about what had happened in the world, I had lost all faith in mankind. But after spending five days here with you people, you've restored my faith. There still is good people lifting our world. That could be the legacy of Gander. It could very well be. In a lakeside park just outside of Gander, there is this monument to the local residents who put their lives on hold to help 7,000 strangers stranded far from home on a terrifying day. 
Here, every minute of every hour, thousands of acts of kindness were repeated. Here, in gratitude, passengers created a scholarship fund that will endure for generations. Here, amid the heartache, an autumn romance blossomed. Here, parents were consoled as they faced the prospect of the loss of a son at ground zero. Amid so much savagery, so much confusion, the people of Gander and Canada were a glowing reminder, a reminder of the best that we can be when the need is the greatest.